All right, we're ready for the next part. Quite sure about this. I mean, I know that the temperature needs to change as the snow. Yeah. And why is that? That, that wasn't quite laid out in the problem, but we can imagine that there's lots and lots of snow. There's way more snow than there was steam. Yeah. Because there's so much snow, you would expect this temperature to change by hardly anything. So we can approximate the temperature is not changing. Mm -hmm. Good. So what formula would we use? Part. Yeah. Now we can actually work that out based on our previous work. symbol mean in words? What's that telling? What would that mean in words? Um, right there. The heat exchange from the snow to the surroundings? Or to Good. The now let's be more specific. Does this, uh, technically speaking, does this set stand for the heat absorbed or the heat released? The heat absorbed. Right. Okay. And actually, based on the, what we've already done, we know how much heat the snow is absorbing. Because it's just the opposite. Okay. That's right. So what did we figure out earlier? We figured out that Q for the steam was negative, no, that was a different number. Negative 4 times 10 to the 6. That's right. Incidentally, I'm noticing that your instructor made a mistake on their answer key. Mm -hmm. Kind of a mistake. They didn't put the negative sign in here, okay. but then they put it in here. The key was negative for the kettle. Okay. So what does this what does this number tell us about the steam? How much uh, heat is exchanged from the steam to the snow? Right. Or to say a little bit slower, but that's right. Yeah. Does this tell us? Um, so does this tell us that the steam was absorbing heat or releasing it? Releasing it. And how much heat did it release? Right. Well, it released 4 times 10 to the 6th joules. And who did it release it to? To the water inside the kettle, I guess. Well, remember that we were thinking of the snow as cooling it. Oh, right. So it was releasing it to the snow. Well, you, were, you were basically seeing the right idea already. In fact, take another look at part A. Notice that part A was asking, how much heat must be exchanged between the snow and the kettle? And by the kettle, they mean the steam in the kettle. So they're laying out that the heat is being exchanged between the snow and the steam. Mm -hmm. So this is losing heat 
Um, because it's in temperature with snow, it's in contact with snow that's at a much lower temperature. Um, and this must be gaining all of that heat. Now, of course, in real life, some of the heat would leak out into the air. But we simplify in these problems into thinking that just kind of two elements interacting with each other. So any heat that's lost from here has to be gained over here. I see. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, so then we know that Q is positive for Good. And um, the temperature is is two hundred and fifty Kelvin. Good. So it's good that you're remembering that we have to put this in kelvins because this is the level of the temperature. And then I'll just do that math. Oh. Uh, more, more practice with the uh, yeah. vision. So you cancel the zero. That's good. Mm -hmm. So then what is our answer for part C? Uh, 16,000 joules per top, positive 16. Positive, that's right. You'd already been saying there was going to be positive. Mm -hmm. Now you put in a positive number here, so it came out positive. But just based on common sense, um, would we expect the disorder of the snow to be increasing because it's absorbing heat? So I mentioned earlier that it's important to not be lazy and put in subscripts here. We don't just want to write delta S and Q. We want to say whose Q we're talking about and whose delta S. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, uh, I mentioned that you have to do that for the delta S's, but I should have emphasized that we need to do that for the Q's as well, because here the Q for the steam and the snow are similar but different. They've got the same magnitude but opposite signs. So it's really important to put in all these subscripts so we can see how things are similar to and different from each other. Let me just mention one technicality that the instructor might want you to see. Again, technically, this is an irreversible process because we wouldn't imagine the heat to suddenly go um, out of the snow and into the steam. But we can imagine that the heat is. We can imagine that instead of the heat coming from the steam, we can imagine that the heat is coming from other snow that's just a little bit more, uh, a little bit warmer than this snow, and that would be a nearly reversible process. So it's still le legitimate to use this formula. All right, so this is something I probably should have mentioned earlier. Earlier we talked about how to deal with these phase changes and temperature changes, but I didn't mention the important idea that any heat that is, uh, any heat that is absorbed by one, well, any heat that is released by one of the elements must be being absorbed by another element. Remember when we did heating curves, the way we solved the heating curves problems was by identifying all the different heat exchanges and saying that they have to add up to zero because any positive heats that are being absorbed must be coming from negative heats that are being released. Well, we're using that same idea here. Any heat that's being released from one place, that's the same heat that's going to be absorbed by another place. So that's another important problem-solving technique that you might want to add to the, uh, the handout there for solving those types of problems. OK, well, then we're ready for the next part. Are we on part B? Uh, yeah. OK, only one more part. Okay, yes, we can go ahead and do that. Good. Delta S for the steam was negative 11,000, so we have to keep using the signs. 
and delta S for the snow is positive, 16,000. So did you get a positive answer or a negative answer? Positive. Of course, if we hadn't been careful with the signs, that answer wouldn't come out correctly. 